You cannot be in balance in the autonomic nervous system if you have dysfunctional breathing because all that mouth breathing and fast and upper chest breathing is doing is putting you into a stress response. Now, then, can we reach our full potential? Can we be productive? Can we be intuitive? Can we be creative? You know, can we really hold our attention on what we want to hold it upon? If all our brain wants to do is to get you out of the situation and launch you into a fight or flight response, it's not gonna happen. Welcome to another Mind and Heart opening episode on Just Happen. I'm your host, Emilio, and today, we're gonna be talking all about the breath. And to do that, we brought on a world-renowned international expert, Patrick McEwen, who's the creator, CEO, and director of education and training at The Oxygen Advantage. You've probably heard of this book, The Oxygen Advantage, because it's been a bestseller and it's taken the health world by storm. And it helps people feel better, achieve their potential, and optimize their performance through this simple act of learning breathing techniques and how to breathe the right way. Patrick has dedicated the last two decades of his life researching and training people on how to actually leverage this superpower that we all hold in the breath, in our lungs. At age 26, he had lived the life of asthma medication and inhalers, and then he discovered a method called the Buteco Breathing Method, and he started founding relief of all his symptoms. So that obviously led him to go in deeper and discover what he has discovered now. And his wisdom and knowledge about the breath goes so deep. He's been awarded fellowship at the Royal Society of Biology in the UK. He's contributed to scientific journals, including the Journal of Clinical Medicine. He's trained hundreds of breathwork instructors under the Oxygen Advantage. And overall, he's amassed this wealth of information for the world to better understand one of the most important functions of our body. After learning about the oxygen advantage, I completely changed the way that I was breathing. Before, when I would exercise, I would breathe through my mouth a lot. And Patrick, of course, as you learn in this episode, advises you to nose breathe swiftly, softly, learning from the Eastern traditions to how to empower ourselves to have actually more lifespan, to increase our performance. Guys, this is probably one of the most important episodes about health that we've done on this show. So I invite you with an open mind to welcome this wisdom and enjoy and apply these tactics in your life. So now we welcome the breathwork instructor and master, Patrick McEwen. Patrick McEwen, welcome to the podcast, brother. What are you most excited about today? I don't know. <laughs> to be honest with you, it's a bit of a crazy day. Um, I travel to the United States tomorrow. Um, I may be going down to South America then next week. So it's uh, I have no idea. All I want to try and do is just get through the schedule for today at the moment. Yeah. Um, so that's my intention. That's today's. Awesome, brother. No, I, I really highly, highly admire your mission in the world. And, you know, as, as we were saying before, right before this call, there's so much going on for you right now. And I think it's because there's a revolution uh, going on right now in the health world. And you're one of the leading pioneers in that, that is bringing about this awareness of the breath that we, you know, as people like James Nestor calls it a lost art, you know, the breath has become a lost art. So I would like to start off with you. Um, asking you why now why why is the world the health world right now getting empowered with this breath information and why are why is the world ready to hear this information now i think there's a revolution happening in many instances i think my age group close to 50 years of age it was indoctrinated in us to be working hard working eight nine hours per day to be constantly striving for everything and I think the, the youngsters coming up are beginning to realize that life is not about that, that there's other things to life. In terms of breathing, breathing has been out there for decades in yoga, but there has been fundamental aspects of the breath that have been totally overlooked. Mm. 
And the idea that it's good to be taking full big breaths and breathing more air is not correct. There has been a number of things that have driven it. Maybe the, the little bit of work that we've been doing over the last 20 years, the box, the oxygen advantage, I think, was was quite a was quite a contributor to it. James Nestor's book, which talks a lot about nose breathing and and breathing exercise and the fundamental aspects of basic functional breathing patterns, which has been overlooked. COVID gave people some reset. And I know myself, like I was traveling 160 days a year before COVID. Wow. And as a result of COVID, I have changed and I am going forward. I'm cutting back my trainings by 50%. I'm cutting back my workload, but this month has been hectic. Um, as I said earlier on, I've had two days off in the last 30 days, which is is not good. So, mm. you know, and that's just the way it is. So it's I think everybody, it's up to us to have some responsibility to be able to and to look after ourselves first, because when you do get to some stage and you're delighted to see the change happening, then it's a case of managing that because there's only one person, there's only much so much time that we have. And ultimately, um, we're not on this planet for very long, you know, realistically. And at some point we say, okay, what's it all about? So, yeah. Yeah. And and as they say, with, with more information that we have access to now that you're putting out in your books and your talks and your keynotes and all these different places, we're empowered to have this responsibility on us of like, a lot of people are, you know, in, in the corporate world, especially are getting these lifestyles where they're working up until, you know, even midnight, you know, the whole day, 12 hour days. And a lot of people don't have these tools that that you have, um, that many of the people that you've helped achieve these these tools have. So right now, let's say if if there is someone going on in a hectic day right now, as as maybe right now, um, you've been in this last month, there are a lot of things going on. What are some of these tools that you can help people tap into um, to regulate that stress level and regulate your uh, overall well being? I think it's really important to be able to tap into your breathing and even just activating the relaxation response. I can only imagine the experience of people in some corporations. Mm. And I very often find that there's a sinister approach there as well, because you've got CEOs and you've got very clever individuals with MBAs and they have very manipulative strategies. In, in other words, they will say to employees, well, you're all part of the company and it's all one big family and all of these strategies, but ultimately the strategy is the bottom line. Yeah. And it's not about the employee. Even the word friend, the friend has lost its meaning. The word friend has lost its meaning. If you think about it, it has been bandied around and it has no depth. You know, people having a thousand friends on social media, they don't have a thousand friends. Mm. So the word friend has been diluted to the point that it's not friend at all. I think a healthy cynicism and skepticism is important. And I think it's to realize fundamentally that, yes, there are individuals that can be, um, they have their own agendas. And it's very important that we as our own individuals number one is that we give people the space to lead their own lives that we're not manipulating others but also it doesn't make sense for us to be manipulated ourselves for me the breath has been fundamentally important for 20 years it has been a tremendous solace it's always been that that source of comfort mm -hmm. so when one is feeling stressed as one does that you can always draw into your breathing and the breathing is always there and it's almost that it's an anchor. Yes, when the mind is in a state of emotional turmoil, you might feel that you're not really bringing a calmness to the mind, but physiologically you will be. Yeah. So it's one that we have to be persistent with. The, the, the nature of the human mind is that the, the human mind cannot stop thinking. And the characteristic of an addiction is when we cannot stop doing that habit. Yeah. And thinking is a habit. And society has really missed its way here because we've been gave the tools how to think and to analyze, but we haven't been gave the tools how to stop thinking. And I'm not talking about a forced thinking, but I'm talking about an ability for the human brain, for the human being to be able to connect with all that's going on around them and for their attention to move simultaneously with time. And it has to be a fundamental factor of why we're here as opposed to most of us going through life living in our heads. So there's a shift happening. 
And the breath is going to be part of that because I don't think that we can bring a calmness to the mind if our physiology is in that fight or flight response. And regardless of what's happening and going on on the outside, at least two or three minutes, if you can bring your attention inwards and slow down the breath and especially slow down the speed of the exhalation. Because if you breathe out fast, your body is telling the brain that things are not good. But if you breathe out slow, your body is telling the brain that things are fine. So we can direct our mind and our brain from the bottom up and 80 to 90% of the communication by the vagus nervous from the body up to the brain. And we can tap into that via the breath. Mm. So the breath is one way about helping to bring a balance to the physiology, about helping to improve sleep, but also about helping to bring our attention into present moment awareness. Because, you know, ultimately, you know, life is challenging. That's for sure. Um, but it can be a lot softer when you have the tools to tap into. And I would say that the breath is absolutely up there. If you think of leaderships, leaders, including Anthony Robbins, he's been talking about changing physiology for 30 years. Well, one way of tapping into physiology is by changing your breathing. And I would like to emphasize not all breathing exercises are the same. It's very important to know which breathing exercises are for you, but it's very important to understand what does the breathing technique actually do? Because there have been so many breathing exercises bandied around and people giving this, this point of view and that point of view and this explanation and that explanation. And what they've been saying is not correct. Mm. You know, and I'm not saying that I know all the answers, but 20 years of experience working with thousands of individuals give you some feedback. And even if somebody says to me, well, the breath does this. Well, if I'm working with my students, I want to see, does the breath do this? Is it really true? Mm. Is it that the theory and the practice is, is meeting? And we really need to have a shift in breathing. And we need, this is a conversation really worth exploring um, because fundamentally the yoga community and Pilates community could offer so much more to their students if they understood about breathing. Yeah. And, and one thing I wanted to ask you regarding one of these breath myths is that we usually hear people say, take a deep breath and, and we, you know, expand our chest. We're, mm. you know, taking in all the oxygen as we can. Why is maybe this method not not a very healthy thing to do and could actually be deterring to our performance and our and our well-being and our mental well-being? Well, it, I remember going into an exam, 1996, 97, I was anxious going into the exam. Yeah. I had read about the importance of taking these full big breaths. And I went for a walk for two to three minutes before going into the exam hall and I was filling my lungs full of air. I walked into the exam hall. I was lightheaded. I was disoriented and I just couldn't focus on what I needs to focus upon. If we take full big breaths, we get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood. And it's very easy to do this. 30 to 60 seconds of over breathing can reduce blood flow, can reduce carbon dioxide in the blood by half. And this has the effect of reducing blood flow to the brain by up to 40%. So taking a full big breath could actually be the very worst, very, you know, the total opposite of what we should be doing. Mm. So many people who already are having faster and harder breathing patterns and irregular breathing and sighing frequently, it doesn't make sense for them to be taking full big breaths. Mm. Okay, I understand some therapies will say, well, we're doing hyperventilation to stress the body and mind to the point that the body and mind does a reset. Yeah, okay. Something like the Wim Hof, for example, that's kind of a, a stressor on the body. It's a stressor. It's a major stressor, but it's really important. And if you, if we're going to be stressing the body and mind to understand what's actually happening there, if, if I hyperventilate and then I do a long breath hold and I hyperventilate again, and I do a long breath hold, hyperventilate again and do a long breath hold during the third breath hold, my blood oxygen saturation can drop below 50%. I'm at risk of passing out. There's a reduction of blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain at this point. And we have to ask the question, we don't know. You know, do, has the science really investigated the effect of three mm. cycles of hyperventilating and long breath hold? Is it good to deprive the brain of oxygen and blood flow? Yeah. And I have been at conferences looking at scans of individuals with obstructive sleep apnea, and it showed that they have brain damage. So sleep apnea is an involuntary breath holding during sleep. Mm. Well, you can still reproduce breath holding and you can re reproduce the effects of it if you're lowering your blood oxygen saturation down to 30%, 40%. There's a time to stress the body and mind, but 
Number one is, I would always say to people, understand what's happening mm. when you're doing hyperventilating. Your blood vessels are constricting. There's a mm. left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. There's less oxygen getting delivered to the tissues. You're driving your blood pH quite high. Like, for example, the body dies at 7.8. And if you look at Cox's paper 2014, using the, investigating the Wim Hof method, mm. blood pH increased to 7.75. Okay, it's still a significant difference between 7.75 and 7.8, but normal blood pH is 7.4. And when you throw blood pH into such an alkaline state, it causes arousal of the central nervous system. Now, we have to think about the heart. We have to think about the conditions that are made worse by, by stressful breathing, including hyperventilation. Tinnitus, vertigo, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, anxiety can be made worse, panic disorder, and like... I'm saying this more so to realize that breathing is quite powerful. Yeah. And I've put people into panic attacks, you know, and I'm the first to say, yes, I have made mistakes with the breath, you know, and ultimately when you're working with people over a long period of time, you do make mistakes. Mm. Now I don't as certainly not as to the degree, because I have got one approach with people that I work with, especially when I feel that these people are a little bit more vulnerable. I go so gentle. And the reason being is because before in the past, I felt there was an urgency to get people feeling better, but I would floor them, push them too hard. And it's the same as, you know, if you had somebody who wasn't doing physical exercise for a period of time, you're not going to say to this individual, well, now I want you to sprint off the bat. That's what hyperventilation is doing. So yeah. you're going an individual who has done hardly any breathing exercise, no adaptations in terms of breathing exercise to the body, and you're putting them into a sprint. You know, now people will say, well, here I'm being critical. I'm not being critical. All I'm doing is trying to investigate that breathing is powerful. And we do need to have this conversation. And this can't be buried under the rug, because when I've spoken about this before, there's people who are saying, well, you're being critical. You're being condescending. You're not. Listen, I'm in the breath for 20 years. I use 26 different breathing exercises. Mm -hmm. I know with experience which ones that's work better for right some there. people. <laughs> and that's important because yeah. this way that we can like this way we can make less, we can make a better progress and we're less likely than to make mistakes. Yes, I love that. And I've always been an athlete um, since I can remember. I was always picking up a basketball. I was always swimming. Uh, I remember, you know, in my childhood, I would... And I think children are very, you know, inclined to be able to hold their breath. And I would always yes. swim under the pool and see how long I could last without my breath. And these are all tactics that I think are very inclinations of our of our inner child. Um, and it's really interesting because when I was 16, I moved from California sea level up to Bogota, Colombia, which is 2,700 meters high. And I remember the first time I played basketball over there, my hands turned purple I was, I literally felt like I was going to pass out. What was going on there? Why are so many people, um, you know, why is their performance affected in different altitudes? Yeah, it depends on the person, whether they were born at altitude or born at sea level, that can have a fundamental effect. So mm -hmm. in the atmosphere, oxygen is 21%. And at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. So 21% of 760 is 160. And then when we take that fresh air into the lungs, it mixes with water vapor. So the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs is in around 100 millimeters of mercury, 105. When you go up to 2,700 meters, the atmospheric pressure decreases. So there's a reduced pressure. The air is thinner. You still have 21%, but you have 21% of a lesser pressure. So I'm not sure what it is at, at um, 2,700 meters could be 600 millimeters of mercury. So now you have 21% of 600. So, you know, and that's how then you've got a reduced blood oxygen saturation and you will feel the sensations of breathlessness because the body is trying to compensate for the fact that the air is thinner. But if you are breathing faster and harder to take in more oxygen, in that process of breathing faster and harder, we're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. Mm. And that causes blood vessels to constrict. So you talk about peripheral basal constriction in terms of your blood vessels, your hands going blue. Well, that can be associated with hyperventilation. 
Now, there is a way to breed in order to improve alveolar ventilation. And what I mean by that is we have, I think it's about 500 million small air sacs in the lungs. And if we think of the lungs as as the branches of a tree, so you have your main trunk, Mm. And then you have bronchi, two bronchi, which are the main branches, and then they subdivide into about 23 different branches. And from branch 16 to 23, we have small air sacs. If we breathe fast and shallow, we waste so much air to dead space. And if we were to breathe no slow and low, so say, for example, you're playing your basketball game, it's likely that you are mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is faster breathing and shallow breathing. This is going to waste so much air to dead space. So you're not getting the benefit of the air that you're bringing in. You're not getting that same gas exchange, oxygen going from the lungs into the blood. Now, ironically, if you were to do your basketball match with no slow and low breathing, you would have a better gas exchange taking place because when we slow down the respiratory rate at altitude, we waste less air at dead space and even keeping minute volume the same. And we can increase the 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 blood oxygen saturation Hmm. to reduce the symptoms of breathlessness. So I'll give you a study. There was two studies that were conducted at individuals climbing Kilimanjaro. They were at a height of four and a half thousand meters and 5,400 meters. Their blood oxygen saturation at that height was 80%, which is severe hypoxia. They had the individuals breathe slow to six breaths per minute without increasing minute volume. So in other words, they weren't breathing more air. Hmm. They increased their blood oxygen saturation from 80% to 89%. So, you know, we want breathing to be efficient, but we also want breathing to be economical. And it starts with the nose, but it's always thinking about, I use the acronym LSD, light is, L is for light, S is for slow, and D is for deep. And a deep breath doesn't mean a full big breath. So we need to think about breathing as being three dimensions. We have the biochemical dimension, the biomechanical dimension. And also then in terms of the influence that we can have on the autonomic nervous system. Do you need, do you want your breathing to stress you out or do you want your breathing to activate the body's relaxation response? And this is the, these are the tools that people should have. When you're feeling that you're low and you want to ramp up, you can ramp up. If you're feeling that you're, you're in emotional turmoil and you want to downregulate, it's very important to be able to do that. Hmm. And I'm not saying that you're not, never going to go out get angry. No, of course not. But life is softer. Life is softer when you have these tools. And I'd also say this, when the mind is in a state of emotional turmoil, the last thing we want to be doing is mindful and paying attention to what's going on in the mind, because that's almost as if it's amplifying things. I think it's really important to change the physiology first and sleep is part of that and sleep and breathing go together. Yeah, and, and speaking about breathing, I, I would I would look at um, some people in my family and, and I would hear snoring just like super loud from the other room and I would go in and check in and, and the first thing I saw was, was my dad, his mouth was open. So um, for people that aren't used to maybe um, breathing through their nose, what are these impacts that, that mouth breathing is having on our body? Mouth breathing is one of those things that is having such a negative impact, but gets very little attention. If you wake up at a dry mouth in the morning, you're not likely to wake up feeling refreshed. If you're waking up at a dry mouth in the morning, you're more likely to be hydrated. Hmm. Trauma to the upper airways can be trauma to lower airways, can affect your dental health, for example, increased gum disease and dental cavities, increased risk of obstructive sleep apnea. So during sleep, you might have the individual and they are breathing hard and then they stop breathing. And this is putting them into an increased stress response. And this in turn is can be driving up blood pressure. It can be having a negative impact on the cardiovascular system, but also on the brain that I spoke about. <clears throat> so mouth breathing, you know, people think, well, sure, it doesn't matter if you breathe through your nose or breathe through your mouth. Well, the reality is that your mouth does absolutely nothing for the breath. It should be considered an emergency. And the thing about an emergency is that you only use it then in very short bursts or short pieces. Mm -hmm. You you don't use it long-term. Now there's individuals, I had my mouth open constantly mouth breathing during light exercise. I would have my mouth open during rest. I was waking up with a dry mouth in the morning and at the age of into my teens and early twenties, I was in that constant fight or flight response. You cannot be in balance in the autonomic nervous system if you have dysfunctional breathing, because all that mouth breathing and 
fast and upward chest breathing is doing is putting you into a stress response. Now, then can we reach our full potential? Can we be productive? Can we be intuitive? Can we be creative? You know, can we really hold our attention on what we want to hold it upon? If all our brain wants to do is to get you out of the situation and launch you into a fight or flight response, it's not going to happen. Mm. I was reading through your book and, and it said at uh, one part that you were learning from a Tai Chi master and you said it was the most perfect breath that you had ever seen. What, yes. was, what was she doing during that breath that, that seemed so like natural for, for a human to be breathing like that? This is many years ago. I met a master, Jennifer Lee, and uh, she was based in Germany. She's a Chinese woman, I believe, um, based in Germany. And I met her in London. And her breathing was absolutely smooth and subtle. Her bolt score, her comfortable breath hold time was 40 seconds. And I remember then listening to, there was some video on YouTube at the time, by also a master of martial arts, Master Chris Pei. Yeah. And he said there's three levels to breathing. He said the first level is that your breathing is so smooth that the person next to you does not hear your breathing. And the second level is that your breathing is so smooth that you do not hear your breathing. And the third level is that your breathing is so smooth that you do not feel your breathing. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, the essence of breathing, and it seems to be the origins, even in breathing that's come from the East, was about subtlety and lightness of the breath. But apparently this changed in around the 1900s. That ideas came from the West to the East, that it's good to be taking these full big breaths. There's something in the West about more is better. You know, mm. more money, <laughs> uh, more houses, I more lived in, cars. I lived in, in Texas, so I know. <laughs> you know, and... You know, and it, it's very often that the extroverted techniques gets all of the attention. Mm. Like if you see it in leadership positions, I think 75% of leadership positions are filled by extroverts. Yeah. Extroverts are the loudest. These are the guys and girls who walk the room. Um, while the introvert often gets, gets overlooked because the introvert can be doing their work and having such an inward perspective, which can be tremendous in terms of creativity in terms of ideas, but also in terms of assessing risk. So coming back to what um, Master Jennifer Lee, her breathing was subtle. Her breathing was light. It was regular. It was in and out through the nose. It was driven by the diaphragm. It was a natural pause after exhalation. And when you compare that to the individuals who are so commonly in today's day and age, mouth breathing, faster breathing, upper chest breathing, irregular breathing, stopping breathing, frequently sighing, you know, it's it's not. And I think it's just interesting that breathing has changed. The idea of breathing has changed. Yeah. That originally breathing was about light breathing and subtle breathing. Mm -hmm. Now there's such an emphasis on taking the full big breaths, but that's the introverted technique. If I had a choice between choosing an employee with an introverted perspective or an extroverted perspective, I would choose the introvert. Mm. And the reason being is because I like somebody who yeah. would be more inward perspective and more in terms of not just talking the talk, but I need somebody to walk the walk. There's plenty of people out there who are talking to talk. This is often now a society, fake it until you make it. Well, we've seen some instances of where that hasn't gone to plan. And I could cite one company called Tyrannus. So, you know, the financial crash that happened in 2008, very much driven by the financial services sector with high risk individuals and extroverts. And extroverts can jump into situations and without assessing the outcome, without thinking things through. And that can bring a lot of problems and it can bring a lot of suffering. There's a balance required between the introverted perspective and the extroverted perspective. There's a balance required between the male and female perspective. It shouldn't be about the male extroverted. And in breathing, that's where it's going as well. Yeah. There is a place for the introverted breathing techniques. Um, 
they don't get the attention because you don't see a whole lot happening. Yeah. But can you imagine that by doing light breathing, you can influence your 50,000 miles of blood vessels genuinely, not just saying it. You can influence oxygen delivery. You're going to have to reduce the chemo sensitivity to carbon dioxide. You stimulate the vagus nerve. You can activate the body's relaxation response. You can have to bring balance to the autonomic nervous system. You can have to open up the airways, but yet light breathing doesn't get any attention. Instead, what gets the attention is the hyperventilation because it's noticeable. But yeah. think about the extroverted person. Do you really want that individual who is doing all the high fives, the person who is the loud mouth, who is delivering hardly anything at all? They're saying the thing, but they're not delivering. And no. the hyperventilation, I just wanted to quickly mention that, is that a lot of people are seeking these now psychotropic experiences through the breath. Um, maybe if they don't have access to ayahuasca, they want to mm. give themselves the DMT breath. And, you know, I, I've definitely been a victim of that, of where I'm seeking these crazy experiences. But essentially, as you're saying that what happens in the body is you're in extreme hypoxia and you're passing out right there on the floor, which is well, not healthy. Well, you know what? I think, I think Amelia, it's, it's really about balance, you know? Yeah. You can do the hyperventilation techniques, but to understand that this is not what it's all about. Mm. You know, and also, does everybody, should everybody be doing hyperventilation techniques? Can hyperventilation bring on tinnitus? Could. Can hyperventilation and long breath holes bring on shingles? Yes, it can. I've seen it. I've seen it with tinnitus. There's a lot of things that hyperventilation and long breath holes are doing that's not getting out there. And... I'm not sure why it's not getting out there. It almost seems that there's a there's a quest to restrict information. So, so yeah, it's a, just watch this space. Yeah. Watch the next five years. Have you been confront, confronted with that of yes. restriction of information? A little bit, mm. yes. But mm. that doesn't necessarily stop me. You know, I wouldn't be in the breathing business for 20 years because when I started 20 years ago, I had so much resistance. So it's natural that I'm going to have some resistance now. Yeah. You know, so yeah, we we've had uh, we've had legal threats, for example, um, not to openly discuss different breathing techniques. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. I was reading yes. uh, I was reading yesterday your book, and you mentioned what happened with uh, Lance Armstrong, and I went to go watch his interview <laughs> with with Oprah. Sure. Um, and I wasn't really that aware of what had happened. I just kind of knew that you know Lance Armstrong he kind of fell off the sphere, and people didn't respect him that much anymore. Um, but I what looked at what he was doing and all the doping behind the races, and their main goal was to increase this EPO and increase their red blood cell count in their body. But then you talked about in the book where you said you can actually do that through holding your breath. Yes. And it's all natural. This is free, accessible. Um, but these guys are, you know, injecting things into their blood, um, which is necessarily not, not the right way to go about it. Well, I don't necessarily blame Lance Armstrong either. Mm. I think the system really there the gave a license for, for cyclists to dope. Because traditionally, they were only tested when their hematocrit went above 50%. Mm. So if you had a cyclist with a lower hematocrit, say a male with a, cyc a male with a hematocrit of, say, 42%, the system gave that cyclist the license to take artificial EPO to increase their hematocrit to as close to 50% as possible, but don't go past it. So... It wasn't just Lance Armstrong that was doing it. There was a lot of, lot of cyclists wow. doing it. And when you've got a, if you're in an industry like that, and if everybody else is doing it, or there's a lot of people doing it, there's a lot of pressure on you to do it too. Mm. You know, and these are young men and these are very driven individuals and they have a lot of pressure on them. So the system needs to wake up a little bit. Maybe it's woken up now, but I'm sure it's still going on in other sports, but there are other ways to help improve your performance. And this is where breathing and breathing, breathing in sports has been very much overlooked. And I think it's because maybe people think that breathing is just about taking the full deep breath, but maybe they don't consider that. Yes, you can do breath holding during your movement, during your warm up. You can change your states. If you do breath holding with controlled doses of hypoxia and hypercapnia, not to the point that you pass out, touch wood. I've only had one person pass out in 20 years. Yeah. And I'm happy to say that. Mm. And it was somebody who passed out in about 2004 because her blood sugar levels went too low. 
And I wasn't even doing labretos with her. I was actually doing light breathing with her. But we can stress the body to the point that we can get adaptations without causing, you know, there's a point at which a good stress becomes a bad stress. Yeah. Now, in terms of blood oxygen saturation, if you were to breathe in and out and hold your nose and start jogging, holding your breath, and jogging until you feel a moderate towards a strong air hunger, with practice, your blood oxygen saturation can drop to below 88%. And that's going into severe hypoxia. You're already in severe hypoxia at that. You don't necessarily need to be going down into the 70s and 60s, and especially the 50s where you can pass out. So what happens when you lower your blood oxygen saturation below 88%? The kidneys become hypoxic. So there's inadequate oxygen getting to the kidneys, the liver to a lesser extent, and they synthesize a hormone called erythropoietin, which is EPO or EPO. Yeah. So by synthesizing EPO, EPO then causes a maturation of the red blood cells in the bone marrow. So now you have these newly formed red blood cells coming from the bone marrow and red blood cells are carrying oxygen. So if you can increase your hematocrit, your oxygen carrying capacity, you will naturally increase VO2 max. Yeah. And this allows the individual then to push their body. In other words, you've, you've got more gas in the tank. But more it's, potential. It's more potential. Mm. And, you know, there's so much in terms of if I was to look at what does breath holding do, but let's look at even just functional breathing and breath holding. You know, you can cause your body to make adaptations to increase your buffering capacity. This delays lactic acid and fatigue. You can increase your repeated sprintability. You can have to open up the airways. You can have to open up the nose. You can improve your sleep. You can have to downregulate or upregulate. You can have to strengthen the diaphragm. The diaphragm is less likely to fatigue. You also improve with function of the diaphragm breathing muscle. You improve core muscle function. And this is very important because of the relationship between breathing and movement. You know, people talk about the core and they think it's all about the abs. But the core is a box. You've got the diaphragm to the top. You've got the pelvic floor to the front, to the bottom. You've got the transversus abdominis and you've got the lumbar um, muscles to the back and breathing is inextricably linked with movement now i've seen athletes with dysfunctional breathing and then the yeah, you question, talked about conor mcgregor which you said his breathing yeah. patterns were, were off <laughs> he could be tapping yes. it at more potential i think so mm. i think so like if i look at somebody breathing during a press conference and okay you could argue that there's a psychological pressure on him, but I think he's well able to cope with psychological pressure. He's a guy, he's a guy getting into a ring after all, you know? So when I look at somebody's breathing during rest, and if I can see relatively fast upper chest breathing, no natural pauses after exhalation, and it's not as if anybody is having a panic attack. It's just that their breathing is that little bit faster, noticeable upper chest breathing. These guys are going to gas out too soon. You know, if your breathing is off during rest, your breathing doesn't automatically correct itself during physical exercise. Physical training does not change your breathing patterns unless, unless you swim. So swimming is one sport which can help to improve your breathing. Mm. From both and and you're breathing through your, your mouth as well. It right? doesn't matter. Mm. During swimming, you're allowed because it's just there's so much of uh, there's a resistance created to your breathing because of the weight of your body being on the water. Yeah. You're also tr training your breathing from a biochemical dimension because your face is in the water yeah. so that you're forced to breathe a little bit less. So swimming is a great sport. The only problem is chlorine is not good for the lungs mm. and, and it can cause damage to the lung tissue. So where do you go? Well, I think it's important for, for athletes to understand that breathing is not just this left of field thing, you know, that's and the other thing about it is that you know many people may not be into meditation and very often with meditation there's a whole connotation that you have to be in this perfectly straight posture and you have to have all the paraphernalia and this has gone too left of field like yeah. meditation is your ability to have to bring this quietness and the calmness to the mind and to connect with everything that's going on around you whether it's through the breath the body or through present moment awareness and yes it can be challenging especially when life situations get in the way. But what's the alternative? Exactly. Patrick, I love what you're doing, brother. Uh, and I honor your commitment to this journey to bring about information to humanity, which I feel like in the next five to 10 years to come, I think the revolution is going to keep picking up. Um, you have your new book, out, Atomic 
focus. Mm. Um, where can people find you? I know you're also training people in the oxygen advantage uh, techniques. Uh, where where would you send people to connect with you further? We we have websites oxygenadvantage.com and the normal social media channels as well. And we have a new app that's coming out in about a month's time, all going well. So this app is going to be free. It contains about 130 videos of the entire Oxygen Advantage program. It's not going to be subscription based. So the whole motive about this is to help to get breathing out to the masses unrestricted. And that's the idea behind it. You know, we were thinking I put in about $150,000 into it and I was thinking about you know, everybody was saying from a business point of view, you need to have a subscription. It's crazy. And I was saying, ultimately, what this is about? Now, at the same time, I think that when we do put information out there, that it's really tremendous for people to give credit and to think of the people who tried to put breathing on the map, first of all, because it was the first 15 years was slow going. I put it that, I put it that mildly. Um, yeah. And now that it's hot, you know, that there is an awareness out there. And I think it's tremendous. So, yeah. So, and long may it last. It will. It will. And I have, we end every segment, um, we end every podcast with the final trio segment. You can answer in a word. It's really rapid fire questions. Um, the first one is, what is your recipe for helping people reach atomic focus and their full potential? It's an understanding and application of good breathing patterns. Yeah, I love that. If you were to give people um, one breathing hack enable, to enable them to have better performance throughout their days and change and transform um, their performance, what would that be? Whenever you feel ramped up, do your best, even though it might be the easiest at the time because life situations take over, do your best to bring your attention inwards and to really slow down the speed of the exhalation. Because when you're slowing down the speed of the exhalation, you could be breathing in a soft breath in through your nose and a really relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out for maybe four or five or six seconds. Your body is telling the brain that things are okay and it has a calming effect. So it gives you some control over your physiology. Yeah. If this podcast were to function as like sort of a time capsule and we're looking down a decade down the line, 2040, and we're talking to the next generation of leaders, um, what is what would you put in that time capsule for these leaders um, to be able to uh, tap into these inner sources of intuition, creativity, all these effects that come out when when we truly connect with our breath and with our body? Well, in 10, 20, 30, or 40 years, if the human consciousness hasn't changed to embrace breathing and embrace the ability to, to be able to bring a stillness to the mind, I'm not sure if the human being is going to survive. Mm. You know, I think it's really, I think this is a, I think this is a fundamental change that needs to happen. And I think it is happening. Um, you know, how can we go through life with our attention stuck in our head? Our education system needs to, to embrace it. Our religious institutions need to embrace it. And this would have been the fundamental essence of religion, although the message has got lost. Yeah. Our political structures need to embrace it. The medical establishments need to embrace it. Yeah. Because ultimately, it's going to be a life of stress. You know, and there's a lot, there's, it's kind of apparent, you know, you switch on the news. I was just, I don't normally listen to the news. I had it on in the car today. I was running around trying to get around town, got back here, two minutes to spare. Um, and it was all bad news. It was just one thing after another. And you're just thinking to yourself, why are there so many negative things happening all at once? Is it that? Almost things get a little bit worse before they get better. And what I would say to people is turn off the news, <laughs> you know, bring your attention inwards yeah. and use your breath as that anchor because, and just even become aware of the information that's coming at us. What sort of information is being fed? Because all it's doing is creating an emotional turmoil. It's not good for us. Mm. Brother, thank you so much for for this time that we shared together. Um, You're very welcome. Keep impacting the next generations to come. 
and I truly appreciate your work. Great stuff. Thanks, Emilio. Much love, man. Thank you.